Chapter number four of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume One, by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number four: Self Consciousness, the Truth which Conscious Certainty of Self Realizes. Translator's Note. The analysis of experience up to this point has been occupied with the relation of consciousness to an object admittedly different in nature from the mind aware of it. This external opposition, however, breaks down under analysis, and we're left with the result that conscious does and must find itself in unity with its object, a unity which implies identity of nature between consciousness and its object. Consciousness becomes, quote, certain of itself in its object. This is not merely a result, but the truest expression of the initial relation with which experience starts. It is therefore the ground of the possibility of any relation between the terms in question. Consciousness of self is the basis of consciousness of anything whatsoever. This is Hegel's reinterpretation of the Kantian analysis of experience. But this result is, again, really the starting point for a further analysis of experience, but of experience at a higher level of realization. Consciousness of self, to begin with, is a general attitude, a definite type of experience which requires elucidation. It has its own conditions and forms of manifestation. Self-consciousness, being supreme, must realize itself in relation to nature, to other selves similar to the self, and to the ultimate being of the world. These are different kinds of content which the consciousness finds its oneness and they furnish different forms in which the same principle is manifested. The argument seeks to show that these forms are also different degrees of realization of self-consciousness. The outcome of the argument is that self-consciousness is truly realized only when it's universal self-consciousness, when consciousness is certain of itself through all reality and explicitly finds there only itself. This result takes the form, as we shall see, of what is called reason. The immediately succeeding section takes up the first stages of the development of self-consciousness, the consciousness of self in relation to nature. This takes the shape of desire, instinct, impulse, etc., and involves the category of life, this relationship while undoubtedly implying the sense of self in the object and consciousness of unity with it, is the least satisfying and the least complete of all the modes of self-consciousness. It points the way, therefore, to the fuller sense of self obtained when the self is aware of itself in relation to another self. End of translator's note. In the kinds of certainty hitherto considered, the truth for consciousness is something other than consciousness itself. The conception, however, of this truth vanishes in the course of our experience of it. What the object immediately was in itself whether mere being in the sense certainty, or a concrete thing in perception, or force in the case of understanding, it turns out, in truth, not to be this really, but instead, this inherent nature, and sich, proves to be a way in which it is for an other. The abstract conception of the object gives way before the actual concrete object, or this first immediate idea is cancelled in the course of experience mere certainty vanished in favour of the truth. There has now arisen, however, what was not established in the case of these previous relationships, viz. a certainty which is on a par with its truth, for the certainty is to itself its own object, and consciousness is to itself the truth. Otherness, no doubt, is also found there. Consciousness, that is, makes a distinction, but what is distinguished is such of a kind that consciousness at the same time holds there is no distinction made. If we call the movement of knowledge conception, and knowledge qua simple unity or ego the object, we see that not only for us, tracing the process, but likewise for knowledge itself, the object corresponds to the conception. Or if we put it in the other form and call conception what the object is in itself, while applying the term object to what the object is qua object, or for another, it is clear that being in itself and being for another are here the same. For the inherent being, and sich, is consciousness. Yet it is still just as much that for which another, viz. what is in itself, is. And it is for consciousness, 
that the inherent nature and sich of the object and its quote, being for another unquote, are one and the same ego is the content of the relation and itself the process of relating it is the ego itself which is opposed to another and at the same time reaches out beyond this other which other is all the same taken to be only itself with self-consciousness then we have now passed into the native land of truth into that kingdom where it is at home we have to see how the form or attitude of self-consciousness in the first instance appears when we consider this new form and type of knowledge the knowledge of self and its relation to that which it preceded namely the knowledge of another we find indeed that this latter has vanished but that its moments have at the same time been preserved and the loss consists in this that those moments are here present as they are implicitly as they are in themselves the being which meaning dealt with particularly and the universality of perception opposed to it as also the empty inner region of understanding these are no longer present as substantial elements wesen, but as moments of self-consciousness i e as abstractions or differences which are at the same time of no account for consciousness itself or are not differences at all and are purely vanishing entities wesen. what seems to have been lost then is only the principal moment viz the simple fact of having independent substance for consciousness but in reality self-consciousness in reflection out of the bare being that belongs to the world of sense and perception and is essentially the return of otherness as self-consciousness it is movement but since it is only itself as such which it distinguishes from itself the difference is straightway taken to be superseded qua otherness the distinction is not and self-consciousness is only the lifeless tautology ego is ego when i am i since for consciousness the distinction does not also have the shape of being it is not self-consciousness for self-consciousness then otherness is a fact that does not exist as a distinct moment but the unity of itself with this difference is also a fact for its self-consciousness and is a distinct moment with that first moment self-consciousness occupies the position of consciousness and the whole expanse of the world of sense is conserved as its object but at the same time only as related to the second moment the unity of self-consciousness with itself and consequently the sensible world is regarded by self-consciousness as having a substance which is however only appearance or forms a distinction from self-consciousness that per se has no being this opposition of its appearance and its truth finds itself in real essence however only in the truth in the unity of self-consciousness with itself this unity must become essential to self-consciousness i e self-consciousness is the state of desire in general consciousness has qua self-consciousness henceforth a twofold object the one immediate the object of sense certainty and of perception which however is here found to be marked by the character of negation the second viz itself which is the true essence and is found in the first instance only in the opposition of the first object to it self-consciousness presents itself here as the process in which this opposition is removed and oneness or identity with itself is established for us or implicitly the object which is the negative element of self-consciousness has on its side returned to itself just as on the other side consciousness has done through this reflection into self the object has become life what self-consciousness distinguishes as having been distinct from itself has in two so far as it is affirmed to be not merely the aspect of sense certainty and perception it is a being reflected into itself and an object of immediate desire is something living for some inherent reality and sich the general result of the relation to the understanding to the inner nature of things is the distinguishing of what cannot be distinguished or is the unity of what is distinguished this unity however is as we saw just as much its recoil from itself and this conception breaks asunder into the opposition of self-consciousness and life the former is the unity for which the absolute unity of differences exists 
The latter, however, is only this unity itself, so that the unity is not at the same time for itself. Thus, according to the independence possessed by consciousness, is the independence possessed by the object in itself. Self-consciousness, which is absolutely for itself, and characterizes its object directly as negative, or is primarily desire, will really, therefore, find through experience this object's independence. The determination of the principle of life, as obtained by the conception or general result which we enter this new sphere with, is sufficient to characterize it without its nature being evolved further out of that notion. Its circuit is completed in the following moments. The essential element, Vaisen, is an infinitude as the supersession of all distinctions, and the pure rotation on its own axis itself at rest, while being absolutely restless infinitude, the very self-dependence in which the difference is brought out by the process are all dissolved. The simple reality of time, which in this self-identity has the solid form and shape of space, the differences all the same hold as differences in this simple universal medium, for this universal flux exercises its negative activity merely when it is the sublation of them, but it could not transcend them unless they had a subsistence of their own. Precisely this flux is, in itself, a self-identical independence, their subsistence or their substance, in which they accordingly are distinct members, parts of which have being in their own right. Being no longer has the significance of mere abstract being, nor has their naked essence the meaning of abstract universality. Their being now is just that simple fluid and substance of the pure movement within itself. The difference, however, of these members inter se consists in general in no other characteristic than that the moments of infinitude, or of the mere moments of movement itself. The independent members exist for themselves. To be thus for themselves, however, is really as much their reflection directly into the unity as this unity is the breaking asunder into independent forms. The unity is sundered because it is absolutely negative or infinite unity, and because its substance, difference, likewise has independence only in it. This independence of form, for the form is a sundered element, appears as a determinate entity and what is for another, and the sublation of diremption takes effect so far through another. But this sublation lies just as much in its actual form itself, for just that flux is the substance of the independent forms. This substance, however, is finite, and hence the form itself is its very substance, involves diremption or sublation of existence for itself. If we distinguish more exactly the moments contained here, we see that we have, at first moment, the subsistence of the independent forms, or the suppression of what distinction inherently involves, viz. that the forms have no being per se and no subsistence. The second moment, however, is the subjection of what that subsistence to the infinitude of distinction. In the first moment, there is the subsisting, persisting mode or form, by its being in its own right, or by its being in its determinate shape an infinite substance, it comes forward in opposition to the universal substance, disowns this fluid continuity with that substance, and insists that it is not dissolved in this universal element, but rather, on the contrary, preserves itself by and through its separation, for this is its inorganic nature, and by the fact that it consumes this inorganic nature. Life in the universal fluid medium quietly, silently shaping and moulding and distributing the forms in all their manifold detail becomes by that very activity the movement of these forms, or passes into life qua process. The mere universal flux is here the inherent being, the outer being, the other is the distinction of the form assumed. But this flux, this fluid condition, becomes itself the other in virtue of this very distinction, because now it exists for or in relation to that distinction, which is self-conditioned and self-contained, an und für sich, and consequently is the endless infinite movement by which that stable medium is consumed, its life as a living process. 
this inversion of character is on that account again invertedness in itself as such what is consumed is the essential reality the individuality which preserves itself at the expense of universal and gives itself the feeling of its unity with itself precisely thereby cancels its contrast with the other by means of which it exists for itself the unity with self which it gives itself is just the fluent continuity of differences or universal dissolution but conversely the cancelling of individual subsistence at the same time produces the subsistence for since the essence of the individual form universal life and the self-existent entity in itself are simple substance each cancels this its own simplicity or its essence by putting the other within itself i e it sunders that simplicity this disruption of fluent undifferentiated continuity is just the setting up the affirmation of individuality the simple substance of life therefore is the diremption of itself into shapes and forms at the same time the dissolution of these substantial differences and the resolution of this diremption is just as much a process of diremption a dismemberment thus both the sides of the entire movement which were before distinguished viz the setting up of individual forms lying apart and undisturbed in the universal medium of independent existence and the process of life collapse into one another the latter is just as much a formation of individual independent shapes as it is a way of cancelling a shape assumed and the former the setting up of individual forms is as much a cancelling as an articulation of them the fluent continuous element is itself only an abstraction of the real essence or is actual only as a definite shape or form and that it articulates itself is once more a breaking up of the articulated form or a dissolution of it the entire circuit of this activity constitutes life it is neither what is expressed to begin with the immediate continuity and concrete solidity of its essential nature nor the stable subsisting form the discrete individual which exists in its own account nor the bare process of this form nor again is it the simple combination of all these moments it is none of these it is the whole which develops itself resolves its own development and in this movement simply preserves itself since we started from the first immediate unity and returned through the moments of self-determination and of the process of the unity of both these moments and thus again back to the first simple substance we see that this reflected unity is other than the first as opposed to that immediate unity the unity expressed as a mode of being the second is the universal unity which holds all these moments sublated within itself it is this simple genus which the movement of life itself does not exist in this simplicity itself but in this result points life towards what is other than itself namely towards consciousness for which life exists as this unity or as genus this other life however for which the genus as such exists and which is genus for itself namely self-consciousness exists in the first instance only in the form of this simple essential reality and has for object itself qua pure ego in the course of its experience which we are now to consider this abstract object will grow in richness and will be unfolded in the way that we have seen in the case of life the simple ego this is genus or the bare universal for which the differences are insubstantial only by its being the negative essence of the moments which have assumed a definite and independent form and self-consciousness is thus only assured of itself through sublating this other which is present to self-consciousness as an independent life self-consciousness is desire convinced of the nothingness of this other it definitely affirms this nothingness to be for itself the truth of this other negates the independent object and thereby acquires the certainty of its own as true certainty a certainty which has become aware of itself in objective form in this state of satisfaction however it has experience of the independent object desire and the certainty of its self obtained in the gratification of desire are conditioned by the object for the certainty exists through cancelling this other in order that the cancelling may be effected this must be the other 
Self-consciousness is thus unable by its negative relation to the object to abolish it. Because of that relation, it rather produces it again, as well as the desire. The object desired is, in fact, something other than the self-consciousness. The essence of desire and through the experience of this truth has become realized. At the same time, however, self-consciousness is likewise absolutely for itself, exists in its own accord, and it is so only by the sublation of the object, and it must come to feel its satisfaction, for it is the truth. On account of the independence of the object, therefore, it can only attain satisfaction when this object itself effectually brings about negation within itself. The object must, per se, affect this negation of itself, for it is inherently, and sich, something negative, and must be, for the other, what it is. Since the object is, in its very self, negation, and in being so, is at the same time independent, it is consciousness. In the case of life, which is the object of desire, the negation either lies in another, namely in desire, or takes the form of determinateness, standing in opposition to another, external individual indifferent to it, or appears as its inorganic general nature. The above general independent nature, however, in the case of which negation takes place the form of absolute negation, is the genus as such, or as self-consciousness. Self-consciousness attains its satisfaction only in another self-consciousness. It is these three moments that the notion of self-consciousness first gets completed. A. Pure, undifferentiated ego is its first immediate object. B. This immediacy is itself, however, thoroughgoing mediation. It has its being only by cancelling the independent object. In other words, it is desire. The satisfaction of desire is indeed the reflection of self-consciousness into itself. It is the certainty which has passed into objective truth. But C. The truth of this certainty is really twofold reflection, the reduplication of self-consciousness. Consciousness has an object which implicates its own otherness or affirms distinction as a void distinction, is therefore independent. The individual form, distinguished, which is only a living form, certainly cancels out its independence, also in the process of life itself, but it ceases, along with its distinctive difference, to be what it is. The object of self-consciousness, however, is still independent in this negativity of itself, and thus it is, for itself, genus, universal flux or continuity in the very distinctiveness of its own separate existence. It is a living self-consciousness. A self-consciousness has before it a self-consciousness. Only so, and only then, is it self-consciousness in actual fact. For here, first of all, it comes to have the unity of itself in otherness. Ego, which is the object of its notion, is in point of fact not object. The object of desire, however, is only independent, for it is the universal ineradicable substance, the fluent, self-identical essential reality. When self-consciousness is the object, the object is just as much ego as object. With this we already have before us the notion of mind or spirit. What consciousness has further to become aware of is the experience of what mind is, this absolute substance, which is the unity of this different self-related and self-existent self-consciousness. In the perfect freedom and independence of their opposition as component elements of that substance, ego, that is we, a plurality of egos, and we, that is a single ego. Consciousness first finds in self-consciousness, the notion of mind, its turning point, where it leaves the party-coloured show of the sensuous immediate, passes from the dark void of the transcendent and remote supersensuous, and steps into the spiritual daylight of the present. End of chapter 4, recording by Morris in Arlsey, Bedfordshire.